Greeting all, hello. Welcome to the Women's Center again. Gonna kick off our amazing morning with a fabulous staff reading, beginning with Norris Epps. Can y'all hear me okay? Yeah. All right. This is uh, tangential, but about nine years and 10 months ago, I was right there. And uh, I went on an archaeological dig, and then after the dig was over, I went and visited that stone circle. And it's kind of relaxing, as I'm standing up here about to tell you all a story, that people have been doing this for like many thousands of years. So, <laughs> so thank you all for being here this morning. Thank you, Wyatt. Megan and Adam for having me here. It's a privilege to read alongside Amina and Adam. Thank you, Christine, for helping me with this story. This is a short story, and it'll take about 12 minutes to read. <laughs> Just so you know, you know? <laughs> Do we call it luck or what? We arrive at Siesta Cove RV Park to put the boat in, still tasting honey mustard sauce and onions from Subway, the sting of pink top Blenheim ginger ale. We hear gravel crunch, ricket slam, knuckles pop, spine crack, door slam, door slam, laughter. Dude, good to see you. Back slap, hug slap, why did you bring a power saw? <laughs> Halyard against metal. Is Franklin coming this year? No, he said he had to work. Well, it is good to be back again. Look at Joe calling his wife. Dude, what are you, married now or something? Get off your phone. Phone's off, shirt's off. Already done. Did you bring a tent this year? Nope, did not need it last year. Risky move. You bring one, Mr. Paul? You kidding? Of course I did. Noah only brought the sand crawler tarp. When it rains three nights straight, I am not letting you in my tent. No way it rains. Good vibes, man. Thoughts become things. Let's get the gear unloaded, then park the cars. Can we get all the gear out there in two trips? Maybe. Chris brought the dinghy and wants to sail all the way, if not. But just then, a brand spanking new white F-250 chugs around the corner. It slows right beside us. It slams the gas and whammo, NASCAR in our faces. Gravel dust, diesel stench, and stanky burned rubber. The tires spin out and the engine burns and the truck drives straight down the boat ramp and into Lake Murray. Oil tang smells up the air. No problem, we think. It will pop an Evinrood right over the tailgate and idle off into the lake like a normal aquatic F-250. <laughs> a redneck Riviera innovation. Steam rises from under the hood, and we hear a weak little hiss. Then we yell, call an ambulance, let's go get him. Pad, pad, feet slam on dock wood, get a rope. Hey, man, can you put it in reverse? Never mind, can you roll down the window? It is going to sink. Stay away from the engine. The truck sinks, and we dive, splash, and taste tepid lake water as it slides through our nostrils. Suicide truck man rolls the window half down. Then the electricals fizz out. We lean in the window and grab his arm, clamber onto the rear wheel to stabilize it, run back to the gear to find rope. Can you climb out of there? What is your name? Can you speak? No, do not try to open the door. He is stuck. 
He is not coming out. You are doing fine, man. We got you. The RV park manager backs his truck to the top of the boat ramp so that we can try to pull it out, yelling, an ambulance is on the way. Throw me that. Another splash. Whip, snap, water droplets. We hitch the rope around the tow ball. You sure that will hold? It is climbing rope. It would hold a VW bug from a cliff. Get off there. I am stabilizing it. The tire tread is new under our toes. We fudge the knot and retie. Swim to shore and grab a rock. We need to put chocks under the tires to keep it from rolling farther. Splash. Underwater stillness. Eardrums, shoosh. Murmured voices. Rubber scrapes our index fingers as we lump the chocks into the lake bottom mush. We lose contact lenses, lose breath, might lose our fingers if the truck slips and the tires roll forward. We break water and breathe. The manager gently guns the engine of his truck. The rope stretches. It is going to snap. Get back, idiot. Do not worry, it will not snap. Pulling it out is not working. Yes, it is. See, it moved. Get back from there, fuck. Engine guns, gravel skitters, loosh, water gurgles. Okay, now put the chocks under it. We are underwater again and move the chocks, clack halfway up the ramp. The rope groans as the manager's truck tugs the brand spanking new white F-250 up onto the ramp. We gather behind its front bumper to push. A woman on land screams at us to get away. What if the rope snaps and it crushes y'all? We get away. The truck is tugged out and up the boat ramp. On level ground, we open the truck's door to an exhale of spilling water. We lift the suicide truck man. His thighs, arms, and left leg are set at rigid angles, stiff as a mannequin. The right leg of his soggy jeans flaps empty below his knee. Wire-rimmed glasses, gray t-shirt, he looks none of us in the eye. We set him on the grass. He rolls sideways onto his elbow. The gray gravel dust sticks to his jeans. The elderly RV camp residents emerge to work out what happened. Clemson pendants flutter from fences and mailboxes around each RV. One garnet and black flag, go Cox, flutters behind the old woman's golf cart. She ashes her sig into the breeze. The manager approaches us from talking to the suicide truck man. I am a former cop, he says. Tell me what happened. We tell the manager that we were just standing here, unloading our gear for a camping trip, and this truck comes around the corner and hits the gas and terraces it straight down the boat ramp and right into the lake. I will stay with him till the ambulance shows up, the manager says. We are lucky y'all were here. The guy says his prosthetic just slipped off and got stuck on the gas pedal. The manager offers us free weekend parking. <laughs> we accept and say, <laughs> and say, thank you even though we had already paid the teller inside the lodge. We talk amongst ourselves. We are the youngest, strongest people in Siesta Cove RV Park. <laughs> Which is to say the only ones without beer guts yet. But what if we had slept in this morning? What if we had taken longer to eat at Subway? What if we had got stuck behind traffic on 26 or Shell Island Road? Each year, we remind ourselves that the island giveth and the island taketh. Last year, 
we saw an osprey shit into the water before it alighted on the branch of a pine, which we proclaimed a good omen, kin to the eagle, snake, and cactus of Lake Tenochtitlan. Sure enough, last year, there were no storms that soaked our food, or lightning that struck nearby pines, or fire ants that bedded in our eggs, crackers, and hammocks. Three golf carts wheel up and ask other golf carts what is going on. We need to get to the island and set up camp before dark. This omen, we think we might have to pay for it. Thank you. Adam Vines. Thank you for coming out. Thanks, Wyatt, for having me. Uh, Megan, Adam, and uh, all my Sewanee family, the faculty, rest of the staff, and all the friends that I've made over the years. Uh, thanks for making me viable and relevant. <laughs> and for indulging me by hiking with me at 6.15 in the morning. And for drinking s drinks that have uh, tater tots in them. I'm going to read first from a manuscript I think I just finished. Uh, the first two poems will be the bookend poems, Maintenance for the Heartbroken. Consider the houses we put together, the maintenance we do and don't do, the rotten eaves replaced, the shutters that a friend half scraped three years ago before the night took him back to needling that vein he thought he'd closed. Consider the toilets we spray with blue, then flush down. The ball of our love's hair we snake up from the shower drain and lift in a pinch of nape as if it were a mouse. Consider what we see now at 2 a.m. in the kitchen, the grout we might or might not finally clean. The bond that holds this floor together will remain, soiled or not, we know. Consider the neighbor's generator still chugging after they have long gone to bed, though the power to our houses is back on. Consider the meat and milk that didn't go bad. We will hear the engine sputter and cease before dawn. Consider the storm that dumped nine inches of snow in Lubbock, Texas today. Yes, Texas. Consider the woman in Montana tonight, curled into the hollow spoon of her husband, after telling him of her affair. Consider her lover as merely a context for another repair, because that's all that he and the husband can bear for him to be. Consider finding ourselves not as agency, but as a slow crack, but as a slow cracking of our shells from the weather of our lives, a seam of flesh exposed that speaks the whole. Two almost innocent glances that miss for years, intertwining one sticky night over drinks with friends, or a sand dune that takes its shape when the clouds drift, allowing the moon to untuck its light. Consider how the clouds seem to occupy the same space as that moon, despite their distance. How we distinguish liquid, solids, gases by their properties, their distances apart, though the way they veil and unveil themselves to us, though at times, like tonight, we find in our chests that they must be compliant to their elemental change, but at their core are just the same. And this will be the end poem, I believe. Preservation for the Heartbroken. The stones I placed across the creek for us to bridge seem unplaced now. All who have crossed this stretch and looked at shed and reap of swell know me as a ghost, the shoal that tongues. The ripples spread, you spread, my love, the darter who took a chance and pipped. I want your gills, the way you navigate the air and water, the why is want, the need we breathe is now. If 50, the need is want and want is need. I can't abide the dictionaries what we will a moment longer, what we should 
because of time, what scales we shimmer and leave behind. Uh, most of this uh, manuscript is comprised of elegies. This is an elegy for Jake Adam York. And I'll gloss a few terms. Hoggers are uh, train conductors, and black snakes are coal trains heaped with coal. That's what the old timers called. River elegy for Jake Adam York. Yesterday, snow, not stars, fell on Alabama, but on my slow jam home over Red Mountain behind a streak of bread and milk stock cars chalked by a field of white, I can't keep from humming the tune over and over, replacing stars with snow. Tomorrow, I would have driven past Tuxedo Junction, where Erskine Hawkins might have brassed those stars 75 years ago in Ensley, or and over viaducts beneath which hoggers haven't hung rails with black snakes or pig iron cars in decades, and foundry molds haven't flushed orange for just as long. And on to the sticks through hollers where my kin ripped seams of coal and piled spoils in rippling rows, healing pulp pines in their stead. And on to beat ten of the Warrior River, where fish camps outnumber churches, where a man stepping on another man's land might see a lightning still hunkered into a bank, or just how deep that river channel is. And on to the dirt road's end, where my kin crawled out of the river, where I would have cut and split a seasoned turkey oak for your visit and piled rocks for a pit closer to the slough. So when we would have run and relivered that trot line by the skinny moon, we'd have fire close when we sculled back to the bank. Then over a skillet of skeeting willow cat fillets, I would have mentioned the rendition still stuck in my head even today, Fitzgerald and Armstrong's and the absurd snow. And you would have gone on about you, an Alabama privet switch driving through Colorado on winter days. And I bet I would have learned from you on that night that will never be what I had to learn on my own today, that Holiday and Coltrane flirted through that number two and the song owes its breath to the 1833 Leonid's meteor shower, the night the stars fell. And I imagine you would have said what I'm thinking now, that a shower of 33 happens only once every couple of lifetimes, and even then it won't happen if you ain't paying attention. This is the title poem. This is an elegy uh, from my best friend, Scott Harris. Lures. Last summer's fishing failures dangled from trees, a rapala and jitterbug a stand a privet paid for, half-ounce jigs with rubber skirts and jelly worms with wide gap hooks on 10-pound test we tithed with overzealous casts at bass. Then off we'd go, our stringers bare, to find a yard to cut, a truck to wash, so we could fill our tackle box we shared again. Today is 12-12-12, the Mayan end, and I, a country boy in Brooklyn for the week, will hail a cab for the first time and think of cows unnerved by fish we missed and shouts of shit that followed, and dawns to dusks and always back with you, my childhood friend. Our girls will never know that pond's deep hole a baseball diamond now fills, the city leader's bright idea or how their fathers sitting in the bleachers on Saturdays a couple decades later can almost feel the stinging nettle against their thighs, the lunker large mouth sweeping the bed with her tail while plastic lizards jerk and drag across the third base line, or how when we untrain our ears to baseball's cracking bats and bitchy parents called strikes and alike, we hear the peepers sounding off in oaks on down the way, our mothers and father's voices calling us home, not too far behind or ahead. Uh, two more. Tell me a story. Father, tell me about the moor who moored his boat in a moor. And <laughs> so ridiculous. <laughs> I still laugh at that. Where the hell did that come from? <laughs> how he ate petrified alligator toes and hid his prayers in snail shells. How he turned into a bear, refused to hunt, spent his days licking the shadows of crows that stretched before him. Brother, 
Tell me the one about the woman who planted her husband's pool cue in the ochre loam of her childhood creek, the smooth ash nodding into dogwood, the blue tips sobering blooms. Tell me about the woman at the dump, her eyes large and dark as a mule's, how she enters our dreams when she gathers our junk. Mother, tell me about the bricklayer who was taken away to rebuild the city of God, how he didn't need a plumb line to lay the golden courses, how his trowel turned into a crappie when he was done. But this time, let me finish. His son mixed what he learned in Sunday school and comic books to try to make sense of it all. Wished he were Thor, winged crown of tinfoil on his head, his father's brick hammer dangling from a belt loop, how he descended into the underworld of the basement to find his father after the burning bush was just burning brush and the rainbow bridge was merely the long frown of the morning storm. My daughter, whenever I read, says, Daddy, are you going to read a poem about me? And I said, yeah, I'll find a poem. She's, and then she'll say, no, I mean, read all of your poems have to be about me. <laughs> So I'll read a poem about my precocious daughter and maybe how I was precocious when I was a child. Question from a bowl of beans. A bite of beans, a long milk draw, and then a side glance. What's it like to be a boy, she asked. Tiresias first came to mind, the mating snakes he struck, the female dead, his seven years in women's flesh that followed. Didacticism at, his, at its worst, I thought, especially how to explain his lie to Hera, pleasures of the we and woo and homosocial bonds, the kind of myth an eight-year-old like mine would dig, then dig at me until I broke, explaining different parts in dumbass boys, the birds and bees. My wife was teaching dance that night and would have struck me blind if it had gone that way. <laughs> Instead, I merely said, it ain't that bad. A lie, of course, <laughs> then took another bite of beans. The penis seems to be a lot of trouble, she said, <laughs> while looking down into her bowl. And once again, I thought, deflect. <laughs> I could bring Nana into play, and how at eight, I told my class about my front tail, unzip my pants to show them when they said I lied. Miss Walker screamed the long walk down the hall, how Nana let me think I had a tail for years until that day when I walked home and Daddy told me about the penis, the <laughs> stiff-tailed ways. I knew it ain't that bad would hardly do for this. I said, you're right, it is a lot of trouble. Stay away. <laughs> I am not that tall. First, happy birthday to Margo. And Julie. Okay, so a bit of a thank you before I start. Kind of wrote it down so I wouldn't mess it up. So over the years, I've learned much at the Swanee Writers Conference. Bar Barbara Prunty taught me the correct way to eat crawfish. My fellow staff taught me how to make coffee and trouble. My dorm babies taught me how to be compassionate. But what the conference on the whole showed me was that there was a way for writers to be in the world that did not involve jockeying for position or upstaging one another. The Swanee Writers Conference taught me that there is a time to be on stage and a time to be in the audience and the value of each. So welcome back to Leah. Thank you to Wyatt to creating a space that has taught me so much. So everybody, all the classicists have been reading poems about the Trojan War. So I felt like I had to throw my hat in. I'm going to read a short short called Love Crayusa. It's an epistle from Dido to Crayusa. Dido is the queen of Carthage. Um, when 
Aeneas first sees her, Virgil says, Dux femina facti. There are plenty of ways you can translate that, but it kind of means the leader was a woman or it was made by a woman. Creusa was his first wife. She didn't make it out of Troy. Um, and if you don't know the rest, then you're just out of luck. <laughs> the hardest part is the telling. Courtesy makes him tell you his story. Good favor is hard to come by. He cannot risk enemies. Seated before your guest, cloaked in homage that is your due, you take it all in. The words, weariness, and despair of one who has seen his world torn asunder, carried it like a father upon his shoulders, dragged it by the hand through the cindered throng like a young balking son left it behind like a drudgingly slow wife. The city burns again with each retelling and we are once more betrayed. Strong walls and gates smoke down to embers. Too late do we learn to fear strange gifts. After the retainers have sought their beds, you call him to you. Lying in his arms, thinking him what the gods have promised, you come to know the fickleness of time and nature. The dice have already been cast. Priestess one day, whore the next, honored widow, scorned wife. Precari I'm sorry, daughter-in-law to the gods, woman termed wisp of smoke. Precarious is the love women fall prey to when they love the man in his power and his piety. The gods move among us without ever begging pardon. When you have done all that they require, then they ask for blood. Bowers become pyres and you rue the day you offered hospitality, just as you rue the night he came to your bed. See how Juno's face blows like an unfettered wind. Now that it has come to this, you ask what it was all for. A woman's glance lingering too long, bringing discord and jealousy. An upstart's prerogative to take that which was never his all for the ill-aimed flick of a spear against hollowed wood. So now I'm gonna read a regular, not classic story. Um, there are a whole lot of Boricuas at this conference and I was already planning to read a... Wepa! I was already planning to read this story but you guys being here just made it that much more fantastic. So um, this story is called clave, which is a musical instrument that you hear in salsa. Um, blame it on the clave, on the beat, on this October night that frees you from a week of seminars, research, and teaching first year writing to college freshmen. Blame it on the other black and brown PhD students who have agreed to come out tonight the ones you've met through the monthly mandatory sponsored events the fellowship coordinator makes you attend in order to keep your funding. You are six in all, three men, three women, six Penn grad students drawn from English, history, anthropology, sociology, and one guy from the School of Ed. Together, you've all been to Bluzet, Cuba Libre, Zanzibar Blue, Five Spot, and M Lounge. Since August, your small group has been meeting every Friday. Weekly, the six of you pool your meager earnings for a night out, getting as far away from campus as your money will take you, riding down to the edge of the city or just shy of it, where you clamber over cobblestone streets and wander through the oldest parts of Philadelphia. No, you can't really afford these weekly excursions, but these Friday nights remind you, one and all, that you are more than grad student grunts and that there is a real world living cheek to jowl right beside the academic one. What's it gonna be then, eh? You ask once you are all gathered at the mouth of the L station at 40th and Market. Zochi, a fourth year, also from English, laughs, the only one to get your clockwork, clockwork orange reference. Half Boricua, half Chicana, lithe and willowy, beautiful with her hair brushed into a high puff and a choker made of beads and cowrie shells around her neck, Zochi is dressed to party in a low-cut cream knit halter top and tight brown suede-like pants with flared bottoms. Zochi was one of the first people you met two years ago when you visited for admission weekend. 
knowing she'd still be here if you came was one of the reasons you chose this university over all the others. Zochi's face is the one you always look for. Just knowing that Zochi is in her cubicle office up on the fourth floor of Bennett Hall gets you through your days. Alvin, a third year in education, says, let's just see when we get there. Short, pudgy, freckle-faced, and in his 30s, he's older than the rest of you, having returned to grad school for a doctor after several years of working full time. Impatient and earnest, he waves everyone through the turnstiles before dropping in his own token and following suit. We'll have to find a place to kick it until the spots open, Rashid, a first year in sociology, says. Travis, a first year from history, agrees. Dressed alike in baggy jeans and fubu gear, the two could pass for cousins. Like you, they're both from New York, Queens and the Bronx, respectively. Each week, they forget that Philadelphia is a smaller city and its spots don't stay open as late. On the platform, Alvin suggests M Lounge and Zochi counters with Cuba Libre, the spot from the week before. You remember Cuba Libre's treacherous dance floors, its slick red tiles. I'm not doing those floors again, you say. Let's just get off one second and take it from there. Enid raises her voice to be heard above the roar of the coming train. Hair done in long, thin, synthetic braids that hang partway down her back and dressed in a short sleeve sweater with a knee-length tulip pencil skirt, Enid looks like a chaperone sent along to keep everyone else in line. ABD and anthro, she's the only one who doesn't live close to campus. Through the fellowship, she receives the same $14,000 annual stipend you all do, but her parents, Guyanese immigrants rent an apartment for her in Center City, down on 15th and Walnut. Enid's fancy building, with its doorman and marble lobby, has apartments no grad student could afford. How about Brazils? They give free lessons, you say. Free is within my budget, Travis says, and everyone else concurs. Graduate school has taught you the value of free things. Brazil's nightclub is long and thin, an exaggerated rectangle. On one end, there's a narrow bar with a small open window that looks out onto Chestnut Street. On the other end, DJ Rockwell, a heavyset Puerto Rican, spins music in his booth on the platform. In the middle lies the dance floor, compact and shiny. Three small cafe tables, each seating only two, line up opposite the mirrored wall. During the lesson, the men stand on one side and the women face them. Everyone takes turns, switching partners with every new song and every new move learned. Footwork with one man, dance hold with the next, a crossbody lead with another, and a rap to cuddle with still someone else. Somehow, through all of the switching, you and your friends keep finding one another, rotating in and out of each other's arms. Ninety minutes later, the lesson's over and the lights drop low. The bouncer lets in the patrons and you lose your friends in the crowd. With the influx of club goers, the dance floor is close and cramped and there's no easy way to find them. You might as well dance. Short, stocky men from Central America find their way to you. So polite and dull, the Hondurans and Nicaraguans. They never spin you or turn you. They know no flourishes. They dance so differently from the way you know, the right way the Boricua way. <laughs> when you dance with your tios and primos, you fling yourself fully into each turn and spin. When you dance salsa, everything in you moves, everything comes to life. Whenever the fat DJ shouts into the microphone, Viva Puerto Rico! And you shout back, Wepa! These men look at you funny, trying to discern whether you're black or brown, when the truth is you're both, and at home, wherever you go. You have no time for questions of, y tu abuela, donde esta? These men, can't they hear the clave calling? Beneath the under instruments, you hear its bright clicks, one wooden dowel held in the hollow of a palm being struck by the other. Your heart is the door upon which the clave knocks, pa, pa, pa. Deaf to it all, these men continue to dance sedately with you when what you want is to be spun out. 
After a week of sitting still, first in the seminars, then in your library, Carol, then behind the desk in your tiny cramped shared cubicle office, you are filled to the brim with academia. You want to shake yourself loose and give it all to the music, knowing the clave can take it. The music sweeps away all of your cares. The clave takes away the graduate chair who's attempting to block you from taking your exams. The clave makes you forget that since your arrival, the black faculty members you came to study under have been leaving for other universities, one off to Duke, another headed to Columbia, where they will mentor students who are not you. The clave erases your guilt that even with so much unstructured time, you still cannot manage to complete all of your assigned reading makes you forget that $14,000 a year is not enough for anyone to live a life. At the opening strains of Aguanile, you leave the dance floor for some air. After the Hector Lavoe song, the DJ switches to merengue and reggaeton to give the salseros a break. You're tapping your feet to Elvis Crispo's Suavemente when Zochi and Enid find you by the small open window at the end of the bar. We're gonna head out, Enid says. Ready? It's barely midnight. The night's still young. I need to catch the last train up. I have to make another stop. Enid blushes and you avoid Zochi's knowing eyes. It's an open secret that Enid is the paramour of a married man, a retired NBA player. She claims it's just for the time being and calls it the perfect graduate school relationship, companionship without distraction. Cheeks still glowing, Enid takes your hand and promises, we'll stay longer next time, right until the end, okay? You ask, is everyone else leaving too? Zochi says, Rashid went to the five spot, Alvin's coming with. I'm not ready yet. You going to stay, Enid asks? Will you be okay by yourself? It's a laughable question. You're a black Boricua from Brooklyn and you're used to clubs that never close and trains that never stop running. You know that danger accompanies night and you can handle anything the late hour brings. You say, I'm good, and refrain from reminding Enid that even though she's older than you, her parents still support her. You haven't been drinking, she asks. Not enough to matter. You've had two beers, but you've already sweated out their buzz on the dance floor. Sure? You tell her, I'm as sober as orals and comps. Then you do need to stay longer, Zochi says. She signals the bartender. Enid hugs you. She whispers, be safe, and leaves to round up Alvin. Zochi hands you a drink, milky white and sour. It tastes like sap. The first sip repulses you, but then you drink and drink. Slow it down there. Enid's hand is on your elbow. Nadia, you okay? Yes, great, you say. Sochi, I love you. You wrap yourself around her. You love the drink and you love Zochi for bringing it to you. You love Zochi for being one of the few actively enrolled grad students of color in the department. Except for one first year, the others are eternal ABDs and have been here for six, seven, and eight years. When you complete your coursework, field exams, and file your dissertation, they will still be ABD. Two will finish after you. One will never finish at all. They'll melt into the city, taking jobs which require no doctorates. Opting for high school and community college gigs, they'll go from scholar to teacher and never publish a thing. But Zochi? Zochi you see at the copy machine in the main office preparing her course packet for the semester. Zochi you hear holding office hours in a cubicle office two over from yours. You wonder if Zochi knows how important she is, how just seeing her is a needful thing. Zochi returns your embrace. I love you too, girl, she says, but take slower sips. <laughs> your friends leave and you remain by the window catching the cool October breeze. You watch them emerge from the entrance below and head down the street before disappearing up market to catch the latch train. Across the street from your perch, a neon sign buzzes and glows, advertising psychic readings. Below it, the large palm of a hand glitters electric blue, open for business. Travis finds you a few minutes later. I thought everyone left. Too early for me. The salsa's black back and the clave is calling. You peer around him for your next partner. 
dance, he asks. Each time Travis tries to execute the combination from the lesson, he leads off with the wrong foot. Soon enough, he gives up on the fancy moves, and the two of you dance the basic through Hector Lavoe's El Cantante and Gran Combo's Me Libere. After the second song, he holds you closer. By the time the DJ plays Africando's Yay Boy, your torsos are touching. Emboldened, Travis executes a rap to cuddle turn, his arm a band across your chest that brings the back of your body directly into contact with the front of his. He nips your ear and whispers, you taste like salt. You answer, I'm a margarita. <laughs> When he turns you back to face him once more, you're both slick with sweat. The clave tells you to drop your dance hold and twine your arms around his neck. The clave calls out the beat, sets the rhythm, establishes the pattern, but when Travis wedges his knee between your legs and pulls you into him, the formal steps no longer matter. Quick, quick, slow has a whole new meaning. He drags his teeth across your neck like tines scraping the surface of the guido, and for you, the club empties. You've seen passion flare up on a dance floor before, but never before has anything like this happened to you. And the fat DJ knows. He knows your mind, knows now is the time to wind down, to switch from salsa to bachata, knows that bachata will send the salseros to the bar to cool off, keeping only the lovers on the floor. Travis brushes his lips across your sweaty forehead, trailing kisses down the bridge of your nose, waiting for you to lift your chin and meet him halfway. His, his kiss is a clave keeping the beat inside your mouth. How strange to have met each other in Philadelphia when you are both from New York. How strange that at home you live two boroughs away, but here in Philly you live only three blocks apart. How strange to be kissed in public and not give a damn what other people can see. By the time the club clo closes, the trains have stopped and it's everyone for themselves. Some party goers head over for the night owl buses and the rest line the curbs on Second and Chestnut fighting for each taxi hailed. The drunk white girls keep getting them first. The cabs won't stop for Travis, but as soon as you move away from him to stand at the curb, one pulls up right alongside your bare brown legs. Travis opens your door, then slides in beside you. It still seems so early, he says. I can't believe they all left. One more hour wouldn't have killed them. Enid says next time they'll close the joint. You give the driver your address. Travis lays his head back against the seat and slips an arm around you. Next time. I like the sound of that. But there will never be a next time. Not like this, with everyone all together. There's too much to do. The demands of the semester pull you all in different directions. Tonight is the last time your group will ever be all together. After tonight, Travis will date you for the rest of the semester. Then he'll go back to the Bronx for winter break, reconnect with his high school sweetheart, and return in January to tell you all about it. You'll agree to settle for friendship, but by February, you'll be sleeping together again once more. You'll think this means he's ended, with her, ended it with her until the two of you are doing stints as summer session RAs and you see a girl wearing an engagement ring emerge from his room early one morning. And what about everyone else? On New Year's Eve, a smaller group will return to this same club and Zochi will end up entwined around Rafael, a new addition to the group, a fifth year complete grad student from Spain. No one will see or hear from her for two weeks, by which time she and Rafael will have moved in together. When he returns to Spain, she'll discontinue her studies and follow him. Alvin will become engaged to a substitute teacher. Three years after his wedding, he'll be divorced. Rashid will drop out with just his masters and return to Queens to teach high school. Enid will be hired as assistant dean at Bryn Mawr, her undergraduate alma mater. She'll love it there and believe that she has found her calling. Ready to settle into life, she'll make plans to buy a house in Rittenhouse Square, throw over her basketball player, and shed the role of mistress. But before she can do any of it, 
she'll be diagnosed with stomach cancer. Three months later, she'll be dead. You'll attend a memorial in her honor and remember, remember this evening when she stood before you in Zochi with her cheeks so flushed and bright. But tonight, you know none of this. Seated in the back of a taxi beside Travis, the clave thrums the beat of your heart and you think all of your lives are just beginning. Thank you. Thank you.